everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Ending Homelessness, A Light at the End of the Tunnel. I'm Nancy Byrne, and I am joined by my fellow producers, Melissa Duran and Sue Levitt. And we're going to take a half an hour and take a look at the depth of homelessness right here in our own community. Yeah, and our community has been through so much, most recently the downturn in our economy these past few years, and that left so many without a place to call home. And, you know, this is really a lot more than just families who have lost their homes. In the next half hour, we're going to take a look at who the homeless are in our city, from our veterans to our teens who are fighting to survive. More importantly, we're going to shine a light on some of the help that's out there, what's being done right now, and what needs to be done in the future. And there are so many volunteers and nonprofit groups who are working day and night to try to end the homeless problem in our city. But there is a population of our homeless that's a little bit harder to reach. And this is because they have found a way to hide away from reality. You're not going to see them on the streets every day. So we start our program taking you deep beneath our city into an underground world that a lot of our homeless are calling home. There are tunnels all over this valley. The mobile crisis intervention team works above ground and below ground. The scope is broad and the mission is, is it's huge. You look him up. We're going to be back at 1.30. We're going to bring him and four other people food. Let's see where he's at on the housing list or if we've got services for him. You guys need to start up with him. Let's make sure that that guy is all right. Okay, give me a sec. Lewis and his team head underground every day into these dark tunnels under the strip, looking for anyone who will accept their help. They make up the mobile crisis intervention team with help of Southern Nevada. He's been living there for I don't know how many years, dude. It would be interesting to see if he made it, though. How you doing, bro? Yeah, I'm with the outreach team. Hey, man, you remember me. Lewis comes by to check on this man every day, and every day he rejects help. We'll keep coming back because we know one day it's going to be the yes, and as soon as the yes occurs, we're able to spring into action and we're able to deliver those services in a really efficient manner. And Lewis may have never thought he would receive a yes from this man, Ricky Cole. He's lived in the tunnels for over 20 years. I said, don't come down here. I'll throw a chair at you. Ricky was the harder not to crack uh, and there was a whole lot of going down there and a whole lot of us just meeting with him and, and maybe giving him some food items or bringing some water or taking him giving him some bus passes to get to an appointment assisting him with his food stamps and all of those kind of things so that we could prove to him that like look we're not we don't want anything from you. We want to help you, and we will say what we do, and we'll do what we say. Ricky was forced into the tunnels after a drug problem took over his life. He lost everything and had nowhere else to go. So he set up his home underground and became set in his ways, hopeless of a better life. But Lewis and his team had a better plan. They never stopped trying, and over time were able to build a relationship with Ricky and eventually gain his trust. We have been working with him for approximately seven years. He is a couple of weeks from graduating from HVAC school, and that is a significant step and a significant improvement uh, in regards to his, you know, where he came from and where he's going. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Who would have thought that he, and he's never missed a day of school and he's gonna graduate at the top of his class. Ricky is focused and staying on track and thanks to Lewis and his team on his way to achieving his dreams. Everything is lining up for him and uh, just with the school and everything, I mean, it's just evident. He's highly intelligent, he's highly motivated and so, Probably he's in some uncharted territory, which I would call the land of success. It's a good future. I, I mean, set, I set blocks for me to step on. If I stay on these blocks, I'll get to where I'm going, you know, which is probably my own company. Ricky has been housed by help of Southern Nevada and now lives in an apartment in the Arts District downtown. He's drug free and has been out of the tunnels for almost a year. Tunnels never intended for housing but built to protect our city from raging flash floods. You hear it, it's like an earthquake. Just brace yourself. There's nothing you can do. 
try to get out, but you know there's a wall of water coming through the tunnels. It hurts because you're churning in the water and the rocks are coming in and pounding you too. When I got out of the water, I had this fully dressed, had boots on. I was asleep during that flood. But when I got out of the water, all I had was my pants, my cell phone, because it had ripped all my socks and shoes off. And it was because of rain Ricky was forced above ground. This is when he ran into Lewis at a nearby McDonald's and decided it was time to accept help. You have to meet the client where the client's at. And you have to kind of feel them out and see what's going on. And then from there, you have to kind of develop like, let me help you with this and let me help you with that. And then you hit them with the big thing. Okay, let's get out of here. My name is Lou. All right. Are you sick, bro? You know, I've seen you're sick. That makes me a little nervous. Do you need to go to the hospital? He has a friend. Try to help you. He's one of the, out of this program, one of the few people I truly look up to. Tagging along with Lewis, watching him reach out to our homeless population, it's clear he's passionate about what he does. He's driven, loves his job, and is determined to make a difference. Because at one time in my life, I was homeless. And the fact of the matter is that at a very critical point in my life, there were people in my life that didn't give up, and I was an idiot. And because of them, I'm here today. So every time I go out, every person that I encounter, I see myself and what I went through and the opportunities that I had. So this isn't a job for me, this is a mission. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I get to do what I love and I get to actually help people every day. You don't need anything else? I know, I know we've talked to you before, man. I don't want to push anything on you, bro. Lewis and his team are one-stop service providers for the homeless. They are highly specialized and show up offering just about any service someone who is homeless would need. And these services are set up on the spot. We've been working with them for a while. Andrew is part of Lewis's team and has been working this camp down in the wash near Caesar's Palace for years. He's built relationships with the people here. They trust him. I'll come back. Yeah, I mean, you can sit down. Yeah, I really figure it out. It. Okay. You're going to be all right. All right. You're going to be okay. All right. I'll come see you. I'm going to be back later with food anyway. I love it. This is my passion. Um, this is what I, what I come from. These are my people. So, that's why I do this. Homeless, at one time himself, Andrew has empathy. He knows what it's like living on the streets. If he wants to, I'll take it over. We'll do your housing assessment, pre-engagement, make sure you're on HMIS. I remember my first day, the ride home, I just couldn't believe that somebody would actually let me come in as, for work as a job to be paid to do this. I mean, it just was the best feeling ever. I remember I, I rode home and all night all I did was look for encampments. Lewis and his crisis intervention team have made contact with just about every homeless person living underground in the 200 miles of flood channels that snake through the valley. And the team doesn't plan on stopping until these tunnels are empty. How about this? How about if I give you one of these? And then if you do have a problem or, or if you need me to assist you with what we just talked about, dude, just call me and I'll come and get you. There's about 500 to 1,000 people who live in these tunnels. It's quite a few people, and the tunnels don't just span underneath the strip. They span clear across our city, so there's a lot of ground to cover, but people like Lewis and other people who are compassionate about helping the homeless are not going to stop until they reach every person who lives in these tunnels, get them on a list, and hopefully get them housing. Wow. I don't know about you, but watching them go down there day after day, that is just, the compassion is amazing. It really is amazing, and you can tell when you go with somebody like like Lewis, that he cares about these people. He was homeless himself, and so he really has an interest in helping everybody. Amazing. You know, guys, it's not just adults that are struggling, it's actually our youth as well. At an alarming rate, now there is a very specific age group who are often forgotten, our teens. Now, they're not like your average homeless. They can be living a normal life one day, and the very next, they are on the streets fighting to survive. Unfortunately, many of them get swept up into sex trafficking or fall into a life of crime. But one program I talked to is trying to be proactive rather than reactive and train these kids to be successful adults before it's too late. Close your eyes and imagine, if you will, a homeless person. What do you see? You've probably conjured up an image of a person on the side of the road holding a sign begging for food or money. Well, this image in your head isn't always right. Now spot the homeless person in this crowd. 
You can't. And that's because the youth in trouble is doing everything they can to blend in. They're called unaccompanied homeless youth, the age group between 12 and 18, sometimes up to the age of 21, that are voiceless. Desiree Larona used to be one of them. I was born into a hectic family. Um, my mom was a prostitute and my dad was a kingpin. And for the first 10 years of my life, my dad was in and out of jail and my mom was never around. She was always doing what she did. Now, the calmness of a quiet home is not taken for granted by this 20-year-old who has endured more than most of us in their lifetime. Desiree and her 13 brothers and sisters lived through years of sexual molestation and foster care until her dad got his life together. He was the one person who never harmed her. It was where she felt safe. But that changed when her father started abusing drugs again. The very man she trusted turned on her. If my little sister was doing bad in school, I would get hit. If my little brother was getting in trouble in school, I would get hit. And it would happen every couple weeks, and then it turned into a daily thing. And then it turned into multiple times a day. Like, I would get hit before I go to school. I would get hit as soon as I got home, before I went to sleep, he would wake me up hitting me in the middle of the night just because he was mad and he was on drugs. School was her only escape, but even there she stayed quiet about the abuse taking place at home. She carried on like this for years until one day her life got flipped upside down even more than it already was. One time my dad found out my little sister was smoking and he blamed it on me saying that I was the influence even though I've never smoked or drank a day of my life. And he um, threw me against the wall and punched me. And he, gave, he busted my lip and my nose and my eye. And he threw me on the floor and started kicking me in my stomach. And he ripped out like a chunk of hair. I remember my little sister and brother screaming, telling him to stop. And I didn't want them getting hit for getting in the way, so I told them to go to their rooms and lock the door. He hit me so bad that I couldn't walk. And when he was done, when he was done, um, he pulled me by my hair outside and said, you're on your own now. In an instant, Desiree found herself with no place to live, sleeping in parks, friends' homes, wherever she could. She even temporarily went back home to look after her brother and sister, to protect them. But her father's patterns continued, and she was once again out on the street. This time, though, she sought help from Safe Place. The first couple of nights, I couldn't sleep because I was scared that he was going to find me. And they just kept assuring me that nobody would know where I lived and nobody would have my address. You've probably seen their yellow signs all over town. Safe Place is a program run by the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth, which provides emergency services for kids and teens in dangerous situations. Youth can go to dozens of locations for help, including fire stations and Terrible's gas stations. Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth also has a drop-in center where teens can come get services, including haircuts, food, even clothing. Arash Kafori is the executive director. They're in survival mode when they come in. They've been traumatized um, uh, mentally, physically, psychologically. Each case is a little different. Desiree is one of thousands who have endured or are enduring life as a homeless youth. According to the 2015 Southern Nevada Homeless Census, there are more than 2,000 unaccompanied homeless youth and children living on the streets or in a shelter in Southern Nevada on an average day. There are more than 11,000 homeless youth enrolled in the Clark County School District. The statistics get even more startling. A third of homeless youth engage in survival sex. It is a very, very serious problem, and unfortunately it's a voiceless population. Um, they really have no one advocating for them. They really have no way of represent, representing themselves. So Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth exists to serve that epidemic in our community, and it's a growing epidemic. Gafori says, unfortunately, our society is reactive rather than proactive, waiting until these youth are arrested or already victimized by sex trafficking to intervene. 
NPHY tries to intervene before it's too late. They have six programs, including family reunification services, transitional housing, immediate intervention, safe place, and outreach and advocacy. So we actually go and try to build a rapport with them on the street while we're bringing them life-saving um, supplies, hygiene kits, etc., depending on time of the year, water, uh, clothing to keep you warm, etc., and information about who we are. And we try to establish a rapport with them, kind of keep coming back to let them know that this isn't just a one-type thing, and establish that trust. And once they learn more about our programs, they might take that next step and either access Safe Place or come visit our drop-in center. We focus on four outcomes, education, workforce development, housing stability, and life skills. The goal is to keep these youth out of harm's way and turn them into productive adults. Desiree is currently in their independent living program. As long as she studies or works, she gets to live here for free until she ages out of the program. Inside of these four walls, there's newfound safety for Desiree, no longer worried about her father's abusive attacks. She is learning to survive on her own, running a household, holding down a job, and going to college. The long-term financial benefits to proactive programs like these also prove its success for the community. Our transitional housing programs cost about twelve to fifteen thousand annually per youth. A foster care system. Uh, conservatively, 25 to 50 grand minimum with much less success rates. And juvenile incarceration, 50 to 75 plus, depending on the community you're talking about, with less successful outcomes. According to a return on investment study, every dollar spent by NPHY resulted in a $14.23 on average public return. But for Desiree, numbers don't matter. She got her life back. Are you happy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy that I can do what I want and I won't get judged for it. And now her goal is to make sure other kids can escape from an unsafe situation and to make sure when you think of the homeless, you remember the teens quietly fighting to survive. Well, it's important to note that almost half of these unaccompanied homeless youth have actually left their homes due to physical abuse, but they're still very motivated to become successful adults. To leave home and think that the streets are safer, you can only imagine what kind of lives they were leading at home. Yeah, absolutely horrible stories, but they are very inspiring. That's amazing. Well, we just heard in Melissa's story and earlier in Sue's story that there are a lot of organizations out there that want to help, but all too often they work independently. So what ends up happening is some services are redundant some services are neglected. Well, that's not the case here in the Las Vegas community. There's a collaborative spirit here, a spirit that is credited with us being able to meet First Lady Michelle Obama's challenge to end veteran homelessness by the end of 2015. We've broken out of the silos, and here's how we did it. Air Force veteran Rodney Hill lives here at the U.S. Vets Apartment Complex. He says it's a simple home, but it's all he needs, and it's a vast improvement over what he had been calling home for nearly a decade. The streets of Las Vegas. He says for him, homelessness was not a result of a combat injury or post-traumatic stress disorder, issues that typically put veterans on the streets. For him, it was the economy. He landed a good job as a security guard after duty, but was laid off during the recession. That's when he became addicted to gambling. Specifically slot machines, I'm, I'm totally addicted to them. I had managed to stay off them for four years, but I got back on it and I lost my job and just ended up on the street, uh, lost my money. He said after several years on and off the streets, he began to feel chronically ill and beaten down mentally and physically. I had several close calls. I ended up in the hospital one time, a skull fracture. I was just walking down the sidewalk and got uh, beat up. Um, so I, I don't know how I made it. Tired of being sick and tired, he stumbled into the U.S. Vets Las Vegas, one of many organizations in our community that works tirelessly to get our vets off the streets. And we do that through a variety of ways. We run several different types of programs. First, transitional housing with several different tracks to meet the veterans' needs, uh, get them the services that they need that specialize to what that need is, and then work with them on their goals to get them uh, increased income, be that employment income or disability income or whatever mainstream benefit that might be that they um, need and qualify for, get them that, and then make sure we're facilitating a positive move to permanent housing. He needed and received many of those services as well as treatment for his addiction. 
Uh, I'm doing good. I'm in treatment for gambling. Um, I go, I'm out at the VA hospital every Monday and Wednesday, and um, things are going good. I feel good. Rodney is quick to thank U.S. vets, but Executive Director Cabrera is quick to say they don't do this alone. The collaborative spirit in our community is what makes things happen. This is a meeting of about a dozen different area nonprofits. They come together regularly to tackle a variety of social issues. In fact, it's this spirit of cooperation that is credited with our community recently being able to meet First Lady Michelle Obama's challenge to end veteran homelessness and become functional zero by the end of 2015. We were one of only two communities to achieve that deadline. Functional zero means that our community is healthy enough to bring in any homeless veterans who are ready for housing. It also means that we've identified all of the veterans who remain in housing. What it doesn't mean is that we've ended homelessness among veterans, but we've decreased the number, we've made a healthy enough system to accept them all, and also that if another veteran becomes homeless, that episode will be brief and hopefully not reoccurring because if somebody has been referred for housing or somebody has been accepted after they have been referred for housing and they've been assigned a case manager, there should be something there to let you know. This team spirit continues to spread. This is another group of agencies that has been meeting for about two years. Unlike the nonprofit coalition mentioned earlier, this group is solely devoted to helping veterans get off the streets. There are nine agencies included in this coordinated outreach team. Here they are discussing a new project called BOLO, or Be on the Lookout. It's a list of veterans eligible for services. It's sent to the group via fax from the Veterans Administration on a regular basis. And then what we do is we put photos with the names and then it goes out to community providers. So whether it's first responders, parking enforcement, security, um, chiefs at the casinos get it, business owners that have said they want to help get involved, and even some of our health care providers that have said they want to help look for our veterans. And the, these are veterans that are eligible for service. Sometimes um, within 15 minutes of me sending out our BOLO list, we will have a phone call and a located veteran and an outreach team can go and pick them up and get them into the VA. The BOLO list is just one of many projects this group works on together. Again, nine different agencies with one common goal. And it's everyone from the top down has been willing to play nice in the sandbox, if you will, and be a team. And I think one of the biggest compliments to our success is how the people in the room refer to themselves. They talk about my outreach family and my outreach team, and there is no separation of team. We realize that this is a problem that we have to come at together as a community. We have become a community where every agency and nonprofit wanting to make a difference has learned as a team so much more can be accomplished. And frankly, learning that lesson was a huge accomplishment in itself. I think it's unique, first of all, to be a big community and have so many different partners all willing to sit around the same table. And, and in some cases, we had to kind of change how we normally do things and look at things from a different angle. Even as we do celebrate the strides that have been made in housing and helping our homeless vets, we are reminded that we cannot rest on our laurels. No, I, we are proud to have declared functional zero in Las Vegas, but it certainly does not mean the work is done. We realize that there are veterans living in poverty who are still at risk of homelessness. We need to be making sure we're doing everything we can to prevent them from experiencing homelessness. And then unfortunately, if those veterans do meet homelessness, we have to be their rapid um, response team and get them into safe and secure housing. Because it's not so much just finding the veteran and putting them in initial housing, it's really still wrapping around the services that they need around them and, and so our work continues. But at least that work is now being done without silos so that as a team, our community is changing the lives of so many more veterans like Rodney Hill. Uh, I'm glad to be off the street. Uh, I'm glad to be living, uh, I think it's a normal life or trying to get into a normal life and uh, I'm just glad to be alive. If you are a veteran in need of services or you know of a veteran who needs some help, the best place to call is the Veterans Administration. Now, Monday through Friday, you can call 702-901-1366. Evenings and weekends, call 702-706-6089.
there are so many ways that you can actually volunteer to help out these programs and help the homeless in our community. You know, there really is. And being out there with a lot of the volunteers and going along with Lewis and a lot of the people that go and help him, there's so much satisfaction for them when you see that they're helping all of these people in our community. It's really inspiring. Thank you, Sue Levitt and Melissa Dudon. And most of all, thank you so much for joining us for Ending Homelessness, A Light at the End of the Tunnel.